Greetings and welcome to online worship at Elliott Church on this fourth Sunday of Pentecost. Monique and I are here to, at Camp Elliott, um, the last Sunday in, in June, a beautiful day. And um, we we're working without uh, Dr. Elizabeth. And you will be worshiping without uh, the benefit of the bulletin, which due to technical difficulties, we are not able this week to post on the website homepage. But uh, if you would just follow along uh, as if we were all outside together and taking your cues from, from me. And uh, although Monique will not be outside with us as, as you can see, let us worship God. Blessed is the one who lives eternally and exists forever. Blessed is the one who redeems and saves. Blessed is the Holy One. And now just listen and follow as Monique plays and sings uh, the first verse of O Word of God Incarnate. And I'm going to read the words of that first verse for you now. O Word of God Incarnate, O Wisdom from on high, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of clouded sky, we praise you for the radiance that from the hallowed page, a lantern to our footsteps shines on from age to age. confession last Sunday, I offered a prayer by Flannery O'Connor, the celebrated fiction writer from Milledgeville, Georgia, who I learned the next day from a church member was also a racist of very standard Southern issue. This was a surprise to me and I was ashamed I was not more informed or I probably wouldn't have used her prayer on a Sunday devoted to African-American oppression 
from the racism in all of us. On the other hand, she prays to lose her blind spot, mm. even though she didn't recognize the particular one that we are focused on. And by the same token, blind spots were a concern of Jesus, as you'll be hearing in the scripture lesson and sermon later. So I decided it was appropriate to repeat Flannery O'Connor's prayer this morning, with, along with the assurance of pardon that I wrote for it. So let us pray. Dear God, I cannot love thee the way I want to. You are the slim crescent of a moon that I see, and myself is the earth's shadow that keeps me from seeing all the moon. The crescent is very beautiful and perhaps is all that one like I am should or could see. But what I'm afraid of, dear God, is that my self-shadow will grow so large that it blocks the whole moon, and I will judge myself by the shadow, which is nothing. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. Please help me push myself aside. Please help me get down under things and find where you are. Please help all the ones I love to be free from their suffering. Please forgive me. Amen. Dearly beloved, the forgiveness of God is perpetual. God's forgiveness inspires humility, honesty, repentance, and reform. Let it be so for every one of us and for every American citizen today. Amen. The scripture I chose for this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew in the very familiar Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye but do not notice the log in your own? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Here ends the reading of this morning's lesson. Monique will play the second verse and sing it after I read the words to you. O oh God, we hold this treasure from you, its source divine, a light that to all ages throughout the earth will shine. It is the chart and compass that all life's voyage through, mid mists and rocks and tempests, still guides, O oh God, to you. <laughs> Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts give wings to the faith in you that lies so deep within each one of us here today. O oh God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Over the years of reading history, I can remember my silent reaction when encountering stories of some particularly egregious inhumanity. Romans 
crucified thousands of people for robbery and sedition, as Jesus himself was, a barbarous cruelty that absolutely defies belief. The church gave Joan of Arc over to the secular authorities to be burned at the stake. How could they possibly burn anyone to death, least of all her? They dunked women they thought were witches to see if they would live. What on earth kind of logic is that? People were stolen from their peaceable lives in Africa and after a perilous passage across the Atlantic were sold into slavery. How is it remotely possible to conceive of human beings as property and to treat them that way? Lately, the American military would torture captives nearly to death. How could they possibly abide by what they were doing with their own hands to another person? The few objections to these practices went unheeded at the time, if they were even heard. I do not believe satisfactory answers can be found to excuse those behaviors and attitudes, and nobody does today. But what I surely ought to be more worried about is, what could there be that is comparably barbarous, cruel, inhuman, and illogical that we are overlooking in our own front yard today? Jesus not only was preaching a commonplace ethic of his time, judge not that ye be not judged, he was making a particularly Jewish point that God is the ultimate judge, not you or me. But Jesus characteristically added a little dig at our hypocrisy by using the wildly exaggerated analogy comparing what amounts to a speck in somebody else's eye with the log in our own. It was his way of putting our own sin in proportion, in correct proportion to its real importance. It is to our great sh shame that the Kerner Commission report in 1968 got it right. Poverty and, and institutional racism were driving inner city violence, but nobody in power gave heed to the enum enumeration of our national sins and we continued living our precious lives while African Americans were dying. It is to our great shame that Americans today, to this day will make points out of welfare queens, so-called, and poorly educated blacks and unstable families in the inner city without seeing our own direct role in their circumstances. It is to our great shame that we could not get a clue neither from plain common sense nor all the sociological data until people had to pour out into the streets last month in 99 cities in the midst of a pandemic to express the heartbreak of life in America for people of color. What are we missing here? Like those people in past centuries who condoned barbarity, cruelty, inhumanity, and illogic that we do not accept. White flight to the suburbs has baked into American thinking habits of casual insouciance. What are we missing here today? American self-reliance has baked into our living habits a malignant stinginess. What are we missing here? What are we looking straight at and not seeing? Here's what I believe. An axiom of urban studies is that people in every age and culture want safety for their families and education for their children. Safety and education, for lack of which cultures must endure high anxiety and low ceilings to their aspirations. Safety and education, everything I got growing up white, so I have wealth that isn't even measured in dollars. Here is what I know we are missing. It's the way we fund education in our country on the basis of local real estate taxes. Seems obvious, shouldn't be a problem, but we don't see the problem, or if we do see it, we don't do anything about it or won't do anything about it. Germany, to use that example again, saw it. 
They fund all national education from the state level with statewide taxes, not municipal real estate taxes. So school quality does not vary significantly between rich and poor towns and cities. Maybe in the 50 to 100 years down the road, people will read about us in their history books and say to themselves, what could they possibly have been thinking? The cruelty, the barbarity, and the illogic of what they did about education in this country. But let's take this analysis back to the personal level where Jesus had been pointing it. For lack of practicing at the personal level what Jesus preached, we persist in habits of judgment, we call them opinions, on many things of consequence and also of great consequence. How other people dress, uh, how people make decisions and the mishaps they have as a result. Uh, we also form ill-considered opinions that form the substratum of political positions that we take on public issues. These opinions are qualitatively different from wisdom. Opinions are judgments. They are judgments not substantiated by positive knowledge. They're not thoughtful discernments. We all hear the phrase so frequently. In my opinion, well, then there's the other one. Well, if, if you want my opinion, how destructive opinions are when people live on an exclusive diet of them. This is a distinction I was trying to cultivate last fall with my soundings program where I urged us as we entered our transition phase at Elliott Church to get beneath or around or over the opinion level into a more discerning faculty. Opinions are born from our, refle our reflexes, our judgmental reflexes, our vested interests, our blocked emotions, and the imperfect vision that we have of God. We hardly know ourselves, let alone others, because we're always batting around opinions, opinions we wish others would come to in their, uh, in their good time and agree with us. Before you judge a man or a woman and form your opinion of them, walk a mile in his or her shoes, so goes another proverb, and see what walking in George Floyd's shoes for only eight minutes and 26 seconds did for this country. This all applies to us in our discernment phase today here as we seek to make a path forward in 2020 just as much as it applies to developing sound political positions in a country in a racial crisis. To ask God for us to remove ourselves from our line of vision of God is not a bad prayer. It's a very good prayer, which Flannery O'Connor prayed. It certainly meets my definition of prayer as a moment of honesty before God. Flannery O'Connor probably didn't even know she was a racist if the scholars decide finally that that's what she was, despite novels and stories that uh, tr treated black characters uh, as three-dimensional, round, and complete characters. But her prayer, notwithstanding, asked for the means to discover what she didn't know about herself. That should be our prayer, to ask God to help us see God and in that process to see ourselves as God sees us. Well, it was up to Flannery O'Connor to find the speck in her own eye, and it's up to us to find the plank, the log in ours. Will people continue to value her books and stories? Should I? Of course, and she will be read, but with the additional awareness now of her fallibility as a human being. Uh, the article that brought all this to light was in this week's New Yorker, if you want to go and find it. Um, it's, it um, talks about, writes about the letters and publications that were opened for the first time in the year 2014. But you will know if you've read her stories and books uh, that Flannery O'Connor was actually a mordant critic of white people and especially of religious white people. 
That would be us. Well, in conclusion, besides missing the funding inequities that are, that are right in front of us in our educational system, there's one more thing we might be missing, which we don't want to be caught without. Heart, a heart. We don't want to be caught missing a heart. I have to think that that Minneapolis police officer was missing a heart. What Mitch McConnell is missing is heart. What Kellyanne Conway is missing is a heart. How about ourselves? We don't want to be caught missing a heart, nor funding public education through local real estate taxes. Now that would be study, something to study during a, a process of studying reparations to the African American peoples. Amen. And now follow again uh, as Monique plays the third verse of our hymn and I'll read those words to you first so you can appreciate them all the more. Oh, make your church, dear Savior, a lamp of purest gold to bear before all people your true light as of old. Oh, teach your wandering pilgrims by this their path to trace till count and striving ended, they meet you face to face. take a moment now to enter into a spirit of prayer and we'll begin with some silence accompanied by Monique so that we can name in our hearts those for whom we ask a special blessing today. Let us pray. to offer a prayer on all our behalfs. Our loving and gracious God, we pour our hearts out to you this day when we feel so awful about the suffering that is going on around us and near us. When we see how many people are in such great need O oh God, illness and death are very present to our minds and hearts right now. Our instinct is to want to intervene and help and save and rescue and prevent people from, from being hurt or infected. We pray that you will give us that power 
and that strength and sense of conviction that we will abide by the restrictions of the of the pandemic so that lives lost will cease cease to happen we pray also particularly for members of our community who have lost a mom or who have lost a dad recently. We lift them up to you and hold them in the light of your grace. Walk with us every step of the long way in this era, which is now four months old, four months old, as we all face the uncertainties um, and questions and, no, and unknown outcomes that lie ahead. All this we pray in, in the confidence and courage that Jesus gives us when we pray his prayer, as Monique will now sing for us. Everybody, we come to the offering time, and uh, I just remind you of the opportunity to do this um, by accessing the giving page through our, our website. And also, during the week ahead, I hope we will always keep in mind <clears throat> the continuing and increasing needs of, of so many people in our community, in our city here in the Boston area. Uh, such that we would be prompted and inspired to give of our surplus and even our substance um, to alleviate uh, those sufferings. Now we'll conclude with um, a different hymn and only the first verse of it uh, to take us out in, in courage and amazement at uh, living in God's world um, where good things happen to all those who love God. And the words are, God moves in a mysterious way, great wonders to perform. God plants firm footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Steps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Dearly beloved, I do hope you know that you can go out into God's world with real courage 
today and with true joy, knowing that the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God eternal and the transforming power of God's Holy Spirit is with each and every one of you. In this precious moment we have together in the week ahead and indeed forevermore. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.